Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back. I hope you had a nice lunch. Um, this, just to double check, this afternoon's session is on solutions to decarbonise the shipping and aviation sectors. It's in partnership with the Institute of Transportation Studies, the University of California, Davis, otherwise known as ITS Davis. Um, in parallel, there are two other sessions. In the lounge is the session on future materials for EV batteries and grid evolution transforming energy landscapes in developing countries and small island developing states is actually at Arena ITC. So what we're going to be talking about this afternoon is how innovation in synthetic fuels from green hydrogen can scale up in production. So we're looking again at indirect electrification with renewables. We need to think about enhanced competitiveness. We think about how we reduce cost and reduce risk. Um, so the first keynote speaker this afternoon is Pierpaolo Cazzola, Director of the European Transport and Energy Centre at ITS UC Davis. Pierpaolo, if you could come up. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will just say a couple of words on the ITS Davis. Uh, so first, thanks to Irina for the invite. Um, ITS Davis is, a, is an institute associated with the University of California that has been instrumental for the development of some of the policies that brought uh, California, I would say, ahead of other in the transition to, to low carbon fuels, uh, in particular the low carbon fuel standard, which I guess people know around here, which has been inspiration for some other policy instruments then adopted, such as those that we have seen now in the refuel EU Fuel EU Maritime in Europe. <clears throat> and uh, voila, so it's a pleasure for me to be here and I uh, would be more than happy to accompany you also later during the panel. Um, maybe I'll just introduce, so we'll have now three presentations. Uh, the first one is from me, the second will be from Carlos and then uh, Carlos Ruiz, program, uh, program officer at IRENA, and then Tian Fu Zhang. The idea is to walk you through uh, low carbon fuel options for aviation and maritime transport, and then diving deeper into renewable-based options and into China's experience with uh, the production of e-fuels, and, and then we'll move into the panel. Um, I would go to the slides, and there's a clicker, perfect. So what I'm going to do now is just walk you through a little bit of an introduction um, of the low-carbon fuel options. So first, the fact that uh, transport accounts for about a quarter of the energy-related greenhouse gas emissions, a bit more if you account for the way fuels are produced, and aviation and shipping, which is the focus of what we're going to talk about today, is about 5%, so 10% uh, each of the transport emissions, but then overall 5%, and um, the share is destined to grow as road transport uh, decarbonizes as Everyone expects road transport will decarbonize with electrification, so most of the fuels will be left in aviation and shipping, and so uh, <clears throat> being hard to decarbonize, this, the risk is that we'll see a growing share. Um, in the case of aviation, there are additional risks associated with the fact that there are uh, climate forcing related with non-CO2 effects, and that also stress the importance to take action. Uh, there are some important commonalities between the two sectors. Uh, so they're both somehow regulated internationally by uh, intergovernmental bodies, the IMO and ICAO, Inter International Maritime Organization, International Civil Aviation Organization. They're both extremely focused on, extremely important for transport over long distances. And they're both unfortunately characterized by a fairly poor track record when it comes to fuel taxation and carbon pricing to date. Um, so that's something that help, makes uh, addressing the sector particularly difficult. Uh, both sectors have been uh, kind of looking into uh, how to decarbonize, and the ways they have addressed this is basically by mixing actions related with travel demand, actions related with energy efficiency, and then fuel switching. And uh, as some of this switching in, in entails changes in the type of fuels, there's a need for coordinated action. These are two, like two graphs, uh, which are one taken from ICAO, one taken from IMO, uh, that essentially show how the two sectors see the pathway towards de decarbonization. Uh, in the top right, there is an ICAO graph from the 
long-term um, aspirational goal assessment, which was published last year. The bottom left is an IMO graph published before 2020, before the pandemic. Before we're talking about now, this is perfectly relevant. So there are, there's the same uh, color coding. This is why I brought them up on the same slide. So the blue wedges are related with technical solution for energy efficiency improvements. The orange, yellowy wedges are related with operational improvements. And then you have green wedge, wedges related with fuel switching. And then what is left in gray in the aviation graph is essentially something that will require offsets, um, carbon negative approaches. So what's important here is that uh, we'll have a, we have a sizable share uh, of related with energy efficiency improvement and uh, less sizable shares from operational improvements. But both sectors see uh, a strong need for uh, an evolution on the fuel mix <coughs> uh, going from here to 2050 with different options possible, and we're going to talk about this today. So that's the focus of what was going to be discussed today. <coughs> Look, looking specifically into, into what are the different options, so is a summary graph. Um, <coughs> what matters is really to look, uh, take into account technology readiness, technical feasibility, the availability at scale of different fuels, and the costs. When looking at like different options, electrification can play a role for short distance, but for long distance is a challenge. And there is where uh, <clears throat> assessments done today show the greatest potential for either bio or synthetic fuels, with a role for hydrogen that comes in either as a feedstock or eventually as an energy carrier. <clears throat> and so that's kind of summarized here, and also summarized in words in the next couple of uh, slides. So there's a key role for direct electrification for load transport and short haul shipping, less so in other parts. Aviation and shipping need liquid and gaseous fuels. Biofuels are cheaper, and uh, so in that sense they are considered as probably the nearest to the market deployment, but they face availability limitations. We'll talk about this, I'm sure. Hydrogen could be used as a carrier or as a feedstock. If it's a feedstock, this will lead to the production of renewable e-liquids, uh, which could be blendable hydrocarbons, as in the case of aviation, for sustainable aviation fuels, or alternative type of hydrocarbons, e-methanol being one of those that is discussed in the case of shipping. There are also uh, e-ammonia, which is essentially <clears throat> derived from hydrogen, which could also be an energy carrier. This has been discussed in other sessions, and in this case, we'll talk about it in shipping. One point which I think is going to be important to differentiate with what is going to be said next is that, uh, and it's an option that will not be covered if we talk about renewable fuels, is the, is the fact that <clears throat> there's also an additional option to essentially use offsets to maintain a role for fossil fuels. <clears throat> uh, so it's the idea of direct air capture with carbon capture and storage. Um, which is in a way competing and uh, also sharing some of the technology developments needed for low carbon fuels in aviation and shipping because direct air capture can be a source of carbon. I am also sure we'll touch upon this during the panel. Last, last um, slide on policies. So it's important to focus on least cost options for the different uh, solutions. That's because of the economics. Uh, there is a tendency to have a near-term focus in policy making. We need a long-term uh, focus in tackling structural aspects to meet net zero uh, objectives. Uh, carbon pricing is key, and we are talking about two sectors that are in need of action in that respect, um, and it's not going to be sufficient. So what more you know, on the policy section for, for policy side for carbon prices is important. And then uh, carbon pricing can be a source of revenues to actually support innovation and technologi technological development. So I'm sure we'll have a chance to, to talk about this. Voila, that's it for me. Thank you very much. And uh, hand it over to Carlos. So as you can see, if Carlos, you would come and join us. Carlos is the program officer for innovation and end use sectors. And he's actually been working basically leading the agency's work on decarbonisation of shipping and aviation. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, yes, I will elaborate a little bit on uh, the role that renewable energies play within the decarbonisation of these two sectors. Um, 
before we go into it, it's good to remind ourselves that not all, not all solutions are equally suitable for, for every sector. And so, uh, particularly with hydrogen, given the, the physical and the techno-economic constraints uh, that, it, that it has, uh, its use needs to be prioritized uh, for the sectors and the applications that can benefit the most uh, from it. And <clears throat> today's uh, sectors that we're focusing on, shipping and aviation, are, are two of these sectors where the use of hydrogen-based uh, fuels not only makes sense, but it's also a critical part of the timely decarbonization of, of these two sectors. We talk a lot about e-fuels when, when we're discussing about these two sectors. Um, it's also good to keep in mind that there are also, there are, there's also uh, other pieces to this puzzle. Um, the way we see it, uh, we, we also need to be smart about our approach in decarbonizing this sector, and it's also important to prioritize the different uh, alternatives that we have, uh, starting with reduced demand, uh, followed by the direct use of clean electricity from renewables, the use of bioenergy, which uh, Pierre already mentioned, and finally, the indirect, the indirect use of uh, electricity uh, through the use of e-fuels. Um, by 2050, as you can see on the chart, roughly 60% of the energy consumed by these sectors is expected to be provided from synthetic fuels. Um, in the case of shipping, we're talking about methanol and ammonia. Pierre already mentioned it. Uh, in the case of aviation, we're talking about synthetic kerosene and potentially hydro hydrogen, direct use of hydrogen in the longer term. Um, but I'd, I'd like to note that there are still a few barriers that need to be overcome, and uh, it's important uh, to be aware of them so that we can uh, develop these technologies the right way. The, this transformation uh, requires a profound change in the way the, the entire energy system works. Um, earlier today, we heard that the total hydrogen supply by 2050 is expected to reach 530 megatons per year. Well, about one-third of this hydrogen uh, will be used for, to produce e-fuels in shipping and aviation. Um, this has great implications for the power sector, uh, as electricity demand is expected to more than triple by 2050, and this is in large part because uh, of the need to electrify the transport sector and e-fuel e production. Um, to give you a scale of the challenge, um, by 2050, the amount of electricity we will need uh, is equivalent to the total electricity consumption of today. And so uh, the challenge is massive, and of course, uh, with shipping and aviation uh, being responsible for one-third of this hydrogen demand, this, it's important that the power sector is involved uh, in the discussions with the shipping and aviation sector. Um, maybe one last point uh, on this slide. Uh, we've, hear, we've heard a lot lately about, uh, or we get asked about whether renewables will be the constraint. Will there be enough renewables? Uh, of course, the challenge is massive, and uh, renewables will, be, will need to be developed in record time in uh, unprecedented amounts. Um, however, we are confident that there are plentiful renewable uh, sources and it's just a matter of uh, having adequate planning and, and having long-term vision and making sure that everything will be in place and grown together uh, so that um, there will be no, no bottleneck regarding renewable energy. We see uh, a little bit more risk, for, for example, in the sourcing of, of green carbon, because not all e fuels are made the same, and so it, it's important that we're talking about uh, green e-fuels. Um, I'm aware of, of the time. Uh, I'm sure that the panel will, will go uh, further into these points, but um, just to go quickly over them, um, the first important point that we see uh, in order to develop these fields where they need to be is uh, there's a need to grow the supply and the demand uh, in parallel, and not just within these sectors in isolation, but across different sectors. Um, 
in order to do this, the development of the necessary infrastructure will also, of course, be critical. And also something that they touched upon earlier this morning, the, the certification of these uh, green fuels will also play uh, a big part in, in the trade and the use of these fuels. Um, the second one, Pierre already mentioned, the, the need for long-term clarity uh, in policy and regulation. And the third one is the need for cooperation. Uh, there needs to be cooperation internationally be, be, um, between different governments, uh, but also public and private sector and also within the different sectors. Um, and finally, within the aspect of cooperation, um, collaborative in instruments such as uh, green corridors, green hubs, we think they play a, a key role in demonstrating uh, the feasibility of, of the use of these fuels and in, in their scaling up. Uh, and finally, just uh, a reminder that we are working closely on these topics. We have uh, lots of resources available on, on these topics from uh, sector overviews to deep dives into the, the different fuels, and they're all available for free on our website. And um, also know that we are working with our members and we're, with our partners to advance the discussions on these topics and to raise uh, awareness on these issues. Um, earlier this year, we had a ministerial roundtable uh, with several ministers and key players in the, in the maritime industry. We hope to be able to have something uh, related to aviation too in the, in the near future. Uh, our next stop is COP28. We have a couple of side events planned with IMO, ICAO and UNCTAD. And uh, we're also supporting other initiatives, including the, the clean energy marine hubs that you will hear about. Uh, in a few minutes, uh, and the Getting to Zero Coalition managed by the Global Maritime Forum. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Our next keynote speech, <laughs> excuse me, our next keynote speech is from Tanfu Jan, who is the Chief Scientist for Green Power Conversion at the State Power Investment Corporation. Okay. First, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to give this talk. And, uh, yeah, the title of my talk is Power and Tomorrow is Transportation, SPIC's Journey Producing E-Fuels. First, I would like to give an introduction to SPIC. SPIC and the State Power Investment Corporation is one of China's five largest power generation groups with over 120,000 employees and 200 billion euro assets. And SPIC manages the overall power capacity of 237 gigawatt with the renewable energy installed capacity of 160 gigawatt. And so the word green power conversion is created by SPIC. It's actually a similar meaning as a power to X. It means uh, we uh, convert uh, green power into fuels and chemicals uh, such as hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, and, uh, uh, and jet fuel, which are easier to be stored and transported. Uh, we know the wind and the solar power is uh, fluctuating and it's not good to the existing power grid. So that's why SPI uh, SPIC's strategy is to convert this uh, fluctuating wind and solar power uh, into fuels and chemicals. So the advantage of doing this is, is because uh, on the one side, we have the largest green power capacity. Uh, our uh, solar power capacity is number one globally, and the wind power capacity is number two globally. And uh, on the other side, we control the largest amount of uh, biomass resource in China. Therefore, the combination of green power with biomass give us this advantage to develop uh, green fuels industry. So SPIC is also a leading hydrogen energy company. The hydrogen fuel cell car made from SPIC got a very reputation in 2020 Beijing Winter Olympic Games. Uh, why are we interested in uh, e-fuels? Because uh, uh, green uh, methanol and uh, green uh, ammonia are an important solution to uh, reduce the emission in shipping industry, and the SAF is important uh, to reduce the emission in, in aviation industry. So this is a layout of the green ammonia industry uh, of SPIC in China. Uh, there are two uh, granted uh, green ammonia plants. One has already been started last year. 
and uh, there will be four more uh, plants uh, uh, under construction, and the total capacity will be 1.2 million ton per year. So this is an example of the process of growing ammonium plant. 20% of the, the electricity goes to the grid, and 80% is used to electrolyze water into hydrogen. We use a battery and a hydrogen tank to stabilize the hydrogen feed. And our cost of the ammonia is expected to be 370 per ton. And this shows the layout of the green methanol industry of SPIC. Uh, so uh, the, the total granted uh, uh, capacity uh, is about 1.2 million, and by 2025, SPIC is committed to produce 800,000 uh, ton of green methanol. And uh, in the future, we will have more uh, plants, and the, the expected uh, total capacity will be 1.1 million ton per year. And this shows an example of the process of the methanol plant. The biomass is pretreated and goes to the gas fire, and the syn gas is purified and mixed with the green hydrogen, we produce methanol. We expect that one ton of methanol costs 1.3 ton of green uh, coal stone uh, plus 77 kilograms of hydrogen. And the, green, the cost of the green methanol is about 420 per ton. And this shows the, the layout of the RSF industry. And so there are uh, already three uh, granted projects, and the, the uh, total capacity is about 360,000 ton per year. And there will be uh, seven, seven more uh, SAF plants uh, under planning. And so for the SAF, uh, there, there are, we considered uh, four technique solutions. One is starting from bio-oil and fat. And there are two routes uh, starting from CO2. One is via facial trough synthesis, and another one is via aromatics. But our main technique solution is uh, starting from biomass and, uh, and facial trough synthesis. So most of our SAF plants will choose this route. And uh, by 2030, uh, we will uh, build uh, three uh, 10 gigawatt industry clusters in three uh, provinces and uh, uh, five gigawatt industry bases in other five provinces. So this uh, shows an uh, example of a comprehensive utilization of green hydrogen in northeastern China. Uh, there will be uh, 3.5 gigawatt uh, totally off-grid wind power and will produce 160,000 uh, ton uh, hydrogen, and this will supply the downstream green methanol, green ammonia, and the green sulf plants. Okay, so uh, finally, I would like to thank our partners for their help to SPIC, and uh, SPIC is uh, uh, always willing to cooperate, cooperate with partners all over the world, and let us together contribute to develop a green and low-carbon energy world. Thank you. Thank you very much to our keynote speakers. Could I invite Pierpaolo Cazzola to come back up? He'll be moderating the panel discussion this afternoon. And this time I won't forget, if you have questions, please do add them to Slido and they'll be answered during the discussion. Thank you. And yeah, it's a pleasure for me to invite our guest speakers. So um, the first one is Bruno Jam. <laughs> Uh, head of New Energy Business Development for Airbus, uh, and then Nelson Moharro, um, Head of Innovation and Partnership for the International Chamber of Shipping. Uh, please come up, yes. And uh, Maisara Abdul Qadir, uh, who's a social program officer at IRENA. And then Karl Hauptmeier, Managing Director for Norsk eFuel. Bernd Hackmann, Team Lead for NDC, so National Determined Contribution and Long-Term Low Emission Development Strategy and Sectoral Support Unit. It's long. It's longer than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Uh, um, at the UNFCCC. And yeah, Emil Herben, um, Director for Product Manager and Certification for Clean Ammonia at Yara. So welcome and right. thanks uh, for joining the panel, everyone. I think I'll move to sit. Um, so um, I would like to get started, like everyone started with uh, 
a round of questions to the panelists, and then, as uh, mentioned by colleagues at Irina, it would be great if you can think about questions and add them on Slido, and we'll bring them on. So first questions are for uh, Bernd. Um, so Bernd, you are with UNFCCC, and we've seen a lot of uh, dynamic developments lately uh, regarding the, the transition and climate action in general. Um, do you also see this kind of acceleration in, in interest and, and ambition and action, in specifically in the aviation and shipping sector globally? Thank you so much, Pier Paolo. Um, and yeah, thanks to Irina for being here. In, it may not be like an obvious fit, me on this panel with, with so many experts really talking business on technologies, on innovations. But what we wanted to share is giving you kind of a, a little bit of a broader perspective, what is happening elsewhere around the world. Because um, you were mentioning what is the ambition of these sectors vis-a-vis -vis also others. I think what we are seeing right now here in, in this conference, but also in, in general in the sector, is something we are seeing around the world in all different sectors. So with Paris, um, a couple of years back only, um, really a new conscious for climate action um, was born. And, and this is driving currently action across the world in all sectors. And um, what we see here is something I think very much mirrors what is happening in other sectors. So um, it was mentioned earlier, ICAO, IMO, came forward with new strategies, new goals, and I think that's really the first step that everyone has taken. Countries come forward with their long-term emission, um, low emission development strategies, with their NDCs, their national determined contributions, and now the two sectors have their own aspirational or ambitious target for the future. Now, where everyone is, um, is breaking this down into the real world. What does that mean? How do we actually get there? We heard um, technologies are available, but not yet used. We heard um, the need for policies is there, and that is the same all over the world. So I would say um, the sector really caught up, or the sectors caught up, and, and are now on par with what is happening around the world on energy transitions in all different sectors. So yes, um, it's great being here, and, and an event like this really shows that, yeah, we are moving forward. Maybe one follow-up, it's uh, some, for example, in IMO debates in the shipping sector, one of the topics that came up during the discussion for the greenhouse gas emission reduction strategy is, relates with impacts on states. So what would happen if you deploy low carbon technologies, what would happen to different players globally? And so in a way this links to the fact that there may be different sensitivities between countries in the global north and the global south. Is this something that uh, you have also witnessed in the, in the context of the NFCCC uh, de de policy developments? Mm -hmm. And do you think this matters for, for shipping and aviation? Will it have an impact? I think that very much, again, mirrors what is happening elsewhere. And um, when we are talking about transition, energy transition or just transitions, um, a lot of emphasis is put on the word just. And um, under the UNFCCC, it is very critical that no one is left behind. Because if we, we saw the energy needs, we saw the opportunities that are out there, we saw uh, what it takes to move such, such a transition from where we are now to where we are going, um, it is very important to ensure that this is equal and fair, so that there is not only one set of winners and, and the rest loses out, but everyone can participate. Because the challenge is so big that you actually need everyone to participate and also to move forward and to drive innovation, to drive technologies and apply these. And I think nothing is more global than, than aviation and, and shipping, which is actually, um, which are the sectors that connect us all in, in everything we are doing. And, and there's a massive opportunity to ensure that everyone can participate to the extent possible, of course. And um, I think what, uh, what we also saw earlier is, is critical, that we look for cooperation, opportunities for cooperation, for joint ventures working together. And yeah, we also heard from our colleague from China, we are open for cooperation. And I think this is something 
that applies all over the world, that we, we have to look for, for joint opportunities. Um, because what we always say is the cake is so big that there is plenty for everyone. So let's try to involve as many as possible so that we can really approach this challenge together. Thanks. Thanks so much. And I'll move now more into the sectors. Uh, so we'll get maybe some more details from Nelson uh, on shipping and then from uh, um, Emil on, on ammonia specifically. So I'll, I'll move to Nelson. Nelson, you've been involved. Uh, the International Chamber of Shipping is involved uh, in IMO negotiations, and sh the shipping sector is affected by policy developments that have been quite significant over the past few months. The greenhouse gas emission reduction strategy with IMO in particular, but also in the EU, fuel EU maritime, the ETS. Um, what is, how is this going to impact uh, ship owners and uh, the maritime sector? Do you want to develop a bit on that? Yes, uh, thank you, Pier Paolo. But uh, please let me start by thanking Irina for the invitation. We at ICS have been uh, very happy to collaborate with Irina, not only in uh, production of key reports for the shipping industry, but also of bringing high-level stakeholders to the conversation, uh, both from the shipping industry as well as from ports. And this is just another example of that uh, fruitful collaboration. Coming back to your question, uh, and I think it's important for the audience to know uh, that this has been a major historical year for the shipping industry. You rightly pointed out uh, what the industry recognizes as a success in terms of member states this July at IMO agreeing on the revision of the greenhouse gas strategy uh, for about reaching 20 zero uh, at around 2050. This is a major decision uh, pointed a direction of travel, but it is a very challenging road ahead. I'm not sure if they, they have the slide that I provided, but shipping has faced transitions before. This is not the only moment, and of course, as you will see, it's, it's the transition from wind to coal and steam, as well as to combustion, and now we're looking at what we call at ICS the fourth propulsion revolution. It is achieving another transition, but with two major differences. One, this transition has to be done within 27 years. 27 years to have enough fuel, enough changes, to reach net zero. The second thing that is challenging, of course, is that we don't have a dominant fuel that we're looking forward to incorporate into the shipping industry, this take up. There is still discussion at this stage about multi-fuel future. That, as you may imagine, presents more challenges ahead. But there is an additional element about this transition. And that is, we have a paradigm shift. We're moving away from our suppliers of fuels and becoming the new sector to the list. We're joining the queue for electricity. It's a major change. We are now part of the sectors that require electricity for fuels in order to decarbonize. And the scale of this challenge, and you can see it on the graph below, is for us tremendous. 3,000 terawatt hour, which represents, in a few years back, the doubling of the renewable energy power in the world. Where will this renewable energy power come from? And how are we going to get this mix of fuels in 27 years? It is not only challenging and difficult, but it is a story that contrary to other sectors, we may be able to help ourselves with because of the nature 
of the current energy maritime link. Shipping, as you know, moves 90% of goods around the world. But few people know that it also moves 36% of energy products. What does this mean? It is that the aggregated demand of other sectors looking for fuels have uh, or provides an opportunity for shipping to be part of that aggregated demand if that production is, of course, located close to ports and, of course, uh, for shipping to transport and use. ICS estimates that we will require tremendous amount of fuels, but it will be up to five times more what shipping will move with respect to fuels. So these are the major challenges that we see ahead. And uh, not only that, it presents the opportunity of uh, dual or the dual opportunity of user of these fuels and also a transporter as a contributor to the global energy transition. So this direction of travel by IMO ETS will need to be accompanied by clear regulations that can favor the take up of this tremendous amount of fuels close to the ports. Thank you, Nelson. You're also yourself directly an actor in trying to respond to this challenge. I understand you've been the driving force between the Green Energy Ministerial hubs. Uh, do you see that as something that is helping narrowing down options? Uh, do you want to say something about it? Yes, uh, thank you, Pier Paolo. Uh, about last year, ICS convened about 100 CEOs of the shipping sector in London. And one key outcome was we're not going to decarbonize alone. We really need to partner with other sectors. That's the ports, that's the energy providers. But we also need to work with energy ministers. It's no longer our arena uh, of transport that we should be looking at. We need to portray the message with the planners, with the energy ministers, that this is strategically important as well for them. That's why the Clean Energy Marine Hubs initiative was launched. It is an initiative that is public and private, linking all stakeholders across the value chain in coming together, in finding out, really, what will be required to have such a large-scale production, what we call a Clean Energy Marine Hub, close to a port for shipping to transport and use this fuel. So we started the conversations, and immediately the answer was positive from Panama, from Uruguay, from Brazil, from UAE, from Canada, saying we see ourselves as part of our strategy, having such hubs, having supports, favoring, of course, the transition not only in their countries, but also in the global aspect. We are now preparing our work plan, that this is not going to be just an announcement, as we've seen so many around hydrogen, but really a work plan that industry and governments will try to commit in order to, in a year's time, two or three at the most, start to show the progress. And that's where we are at the moment. We're planning a big conference of industry for COP28, where now 300 CEOs and vice presidents will come and join us together with the conversation of the hubs on what is the key aspects and how we're going to take forward or implement that IMO greenhouse gas strategy. Thank you very much, Nelson. So this helps me also transition uh, to the case of Yara, because um, I understand Yara has been active in uh, in trying to engage and uh, actually invest in um, modifying terminals to scale up the role of ammonia as, a, as a, an energy carrier for shipping. Yeah. Uh, so do you want to tell us more about that, uh, yeah. Emil? Uh, no, uh, I mean, yeah, maybe for those who, who don't know, we are uh, uh, one of the world's largest fertilizer companies. So we produce a lot of ammonia and we consume it in our production process, and we also 
produce uh, quite a number of industrial chemicals that have ammonia as a feedstock. Um, so we now see obviously a, a new a new market opportunity here for uh, also the use of ammonia as an as an energy carrier in in many different markets. Um, so we we are actively indeed running a, a whole number of projects, both in terms of new fuel or new ammonia supply, I would say, um, but also working with other partners along the value chain to uh, demonstrate that, for instance, um, ammonia can be imported from, say, outside of Europe into Europe uh, and then cracked back to hydrogen you know, and, and stored in, in various terminals um, or uh, uh, burnt in, in uh, new ships. So um, I, can, I can list a number of initiatives that we are together with, I have to say, always other partners um, running all kinds of prototype um, projects. Um, but yeah, as, as the other speakers were also already saying, kind of the, we've set the targets, but now we need to move to actual implementation of um, uh, clear uh, regulations, but also subsidy programs, and, and, you know, and demonstrate that we can do it. And yeah, that's where we, we uh, like to come in. And we're running, yeah, as I said, a number of projects. So you just mentioned regulations, and so my understanding is one of the challenges for ammonia to become to scale up in the, in the trade is, uh, is the availability, essentially, of like a mm. strong safety regulatory background. Yep. Uh, the toxicity of ammonia is sometimes mentioned as a, as a yep. challenge yep. for ammonia to have that role. Do you, do you see that being a challenge, a barrier? Is there a path to overcome yeah. that? Yeah, I, I have a somewhat different view on it than I think most people. So, it is without a doubt that safety is extremely important when it comes to handling ammonia. Um, there's quite a lot of people that say uh, ammonia is is a less safe uh, shipping fuel or, or any kind of you know, fuel, if you want, than other fuels. And I, I would say no, it isn't. It's we're not going to allow you know a higher risk when you operate on ammonia than when you operate on you know any other fuel. It's it's simply that the additional measures that we may need to take will result in you know, additional capex and additional opex. Maybe you need to hire more advanced crew to, to um, uh, operate your ship. So there will, there will be additional measures that will impose some kind of penalty on the, the value chain, whether that's, as I said, additional capex, opex, or, or, or more trained crew. So I would say, so. so uh, for, from my standpoint, ammonia is not going to be less safe. It's just going to face additional hurdles in order to get to the same level as, as the competition. And it's up to us and the other partners in the value chain to make sure that we can do that at a minimum penalty versus the competition. And I, well, I am confident we can do that. Um, but as I said, we, now we need to actually demonstrate that we can do it. And I think, in a way, that the, the the bigger challenge is not so much the, the actual risk, safety risk, but it's more the perception that uh, people have of that risk. Uh, if we can manage to change that, I think we have come a very long way, and uh, you know, the way we see it is to run uh, pilot projects and, and demonstrate to the audience and being transparent in, in, in showing what we're doing, how we've done it, working, with again many partners and ensure that it is that it can be done safely and cost effectively. Thanks. And so I'll, I'll use the safety topic to transition to Bruno uh, uh, and switch to aviation for the second. Um, so Bruno, you've been you work for Airbus. Uh, Airbus as the zero E as a flagship project. Uh, this is what uh, is. Well, it's been developed to bring hydrogen to aviation, the way I understand it, uh, and it's been a strong, strongly communicated by Airbus. So you want to, so that the potentially, let's say, there's a safety aspect that is also related with that. There's so far, as far as I know, there's there's no developed safety regulatory framework around uh, an hydrogen aircraft. This is a challenge also for uh, aviation, like FAA or EASA. 
there's a lot to say about this, so I'll hand it over to you for, for the hydrogen aircraft. Thank you, Pepeolo, for, uh, for the question, for the point. Uh, I'm really glad that as Airbus, I can stand here to present somehow the aviation sector for, in, in this panel today in, in IRENA. Uh, so yes, uh, hydrogen, we're putting a lot of effort on the hydrogen-powered aircraft, which we call Zero E, indeed. Um, at this stage, we are still uh, it's consider we are considering this uh, short to medium uh, range aircraft, so about 1,000 to 2,000 nautical miles, and capacity 100 to 200 uh, passenger. So this is our, our basic uh, configuration. Um, the configuration of the aircraft is not decided yet. We're, we're considering different options which it is a uh, uh, turboprop uh, aircraft or turbofan aircraft, the one you, you see most flying, or even the so-called triangle type of aircraft, what are called blended wing, which is a little bit futuristic. It might not be the first one that we develop, but it, we, it's, it's still in our, in our portfolio of, of studies, where our engineering teams, of course, are working a lot on the, uh, uh, are making sure that we have the same level of uh, reliability, of security of uh, uh, as a current aircraft. Some regulation elements will have to be, to be uh, also developed uh, together as the aircraft is being developed. Uh, but this is, okay, so this is only part of the challenge. Uh, other part of the challenge is what kind of propulsion system do we use for that aircraft? Uh, we are working with different uh, propulsion manufacturers, uh, either for uh, combust combustor, uh, uh, hydrogen combustion type of aircraft, uh, but we're also considering, of course, uh, fuel cells, uh, hydrogen fuel cells. In this case, we have even developed uh, a joint venture called Aerostack uh, with a German company, uh, Erling Klinger, uh, in order to develop exactly what we need as, as fuel cell with the high power, the megawatt class of, of fuel cells. And we are very happy that earlier this year, we managed to, uh, to achieve 1.2 megawatt uh, in, in ground test uh, with such kind of fuel cell. So it's a lot of, of uh, activities going around. Nevertheless, this is only the, let's say, air side uh, part of the equation. We also have to consider the ground side of the equation, obviously, for a hydrogen-based aircraft. And we're working a lot uh, on what we call the ecosystem, which is making sure that at airport level, uh, things will be ready to host uh, a hydrogen-powered aircraft. Uh, the example I can take on that is in uh, New Zealand, where we have an agreement with Christchurch, uh, but also Air New Zealand and some uh, industrial partners like Fortescue and some others, to have some kind of vertically integrated, uh, uh, what we'll cluster, launch cluster, which is very close to the hub that you mentioned uh, for the maritime, where we'll have the renewable power, photovoltaic in this case, uh, the electrolyzer, the liquefaction, and uh, the supply to the airport. All that on the same site at the Christ Christchurch airport. And we are duplicating that in many different places around the world. And I think maybe we can have some dialogue to see Definitely. if we can have uh, places that match both the shipping industry and the aviation industry uh, to create the synergies between, between both. Thank you so much, Bruno. And beyond hydrogen, aviation is also very strongly pushing the sustainable aviation fuel uh, as, a, as an option. Uh, and by the way, in what you say, there's something very interesting, I think, as well, the idea that a player like Airbus is actually investing in solutions, maybe something that is also seen in some of the maritime players and so kind of shows the engagement of the industry. But anyway, so I wanted to go back to SAF. SAF is, um, is largely something that contains carbon, and, uh, and it's contrary, let's say, to part of the focus on ammonia and shipping is, let's say ammonia is not really an option the way I understand in, in aviation, so the focus has been on carbon-containing fuels and drop-in fuels, aside from hydrogen. Do you want to say more about your take on SAF, what is yeah. needed, what are limiting factors that you see, and uh, how aviation is tackling this? Yeah, for, for sure, for, to decarbonize aviation, there is an, no uh, golden bullet, so we have to, to look at several pathways in parallel. The hydrogen uh, powered aircraft is what we see for 2035 and beyond. Uh, but before that, we'll really, really have to take action. And to take action, uh, we're already improving the aircraft by itself, the aerodynamics, the operations, things like that. Uh, but also the, the uh, improving the fuel uh, and having, let's say, less uh, carbon-intensive fuel is also something that we have to look at. So this, this is why, I'd say, the first steps are with sustainable avi aviation fuel, 
with the different pathways, the BIOSAF, uh, which are more, let's say, available and affordable at this stage, especially with HEFA, uh, but also uh, looking and stimulating the market uh, to go into uh, synthetic fuels or e-fuels. Uh, and here we see some kind of synergy with the hydrogen pathway uh, because one of the uh, feedstock for the synthetic fuel is hydrogen. So the one, here, of course, is, is a carbon molecule. Uh, and this is why as Airbus we also in, are investing, I say, in, in directly or indirectly. For instance, we are part of the HY24 investment fund. It's a 2 billion, uh, 2 billion euro uh, fund where we took a part of it, which is investing in different, uh, in different sectors related to hydrogen, including uh, ESAF producers. Uh, and we're also uh, present uh, in the uh, SAF investment uh, area uh, through uh, as a bilateral agreements, for instance, that we have with Qantas in Australia. So we're co-investing with Qantas in some SAF, uh, SAF project. We announced recently also that we co-invested in, in the US with DG, DG Fuel, which is also a, a SAF producer in the US. So we're active in this domain with no, uh, let's say, a, a preset uh, idea of what will be the winning pathway because the different ha do, do have to be, to be developed in, in parallel. Uh, and we, we want to be helping this industry develop because it will uh, just make sure that our, our customers, the airline customers, have access to the appropriate uh, decarbonized fuel in the future. Thank you very much. So I'll, I'll use again the link of the SIN fuels to move to the next speaker, which is Carl. And Carl, you are working for Norsk eFuel, and uh, the way I understand it is like, there's a company that is focusing on some of the pathways that Bruno mentioned, and you also have partnerships in place with uh, uh, aviation stakeholders. Do you want to help us understand what's Norsk eFuel, what you're doing to bring the fuels to the aviation sector? <laughs> yeah, happy to do so. Um, Absolute pleasure being here, and, and Bruno, I think you, you gave me a lot of good pointers that I can pick up on. Um, I think Norsk eFuel, in brief, in a nutshell, we are a project developer um, focused on the Nordics in Europe, developing commercial power-to-liquid projects. So that means the whole value chain, setting up the production sites, including, of course, electrolyzers, producing the hydrogen, converting them into sustainable aviation fuels, synthetic sustainable aviation fuels, which are, as of today, certified. And I think that's also an important aspect of it, uh, certified following the ASTM certification, so they're drop-in ready, can be used as of today. Now, um, in this development, of course, there, is, uh, th there are a lot of challenges that have to be overcome, and, and I think uh, a lot of them are about financing, com sort of convincing investors that this is a good idea, that they should put the money in. Um, and I think there's, there's a huge difference between having a target which is set somewhere in 2050 and saying, yeah, we, we want to decarbonize until then, but you don't have a clear pathway, or having a pathway where you so it see that there's a clear market developing there. And I think also the, the second point, and, and Pierre Paolo, I think you, you were trying to push me a little bit in the direction to talk about it, uh, by mentioning it's, I think that the second point, an, an important part is, um, stakeholder management and, and good partnerships. Because I think we, we mentioned this, uh, we've heard this today a few times already, but partnership is key. And I believe this is also true for us as a project developer. Um, and we've recently announced, for example, that Norwegian Airline um, is taking a strategic partnership role in, in our company. Um, so what that means, just to be very clear, this means that they're not just an off-taker, they are actively supporting the development of a project portfolio of three projects in the Nordics in order to kickstart the development of, uh, of synthetic aviation fuels, of the production of synthetic aviation fuels. And um, why is that? I would say it's a, it's a classical example of a win-win situation. You have uh, the, the airlines, such as Norwegian Airlines, which have very ambitious targets themselves. Uh, Norwegian Airlines, as an example, set themselves a target to decarbonize 45% of their emissions um, until 2030. So 45% emission reduction is a steep learning curve, and we as North Ski Fuel could help to supply approximately 20% of the overall sustainable aviation fuel demand that this would be, they would face by 2030. So that's, of course, something where, where they have a clear interest in seeing this industry pick up, and where, of course, we have long-standing long offtake agreements then also to su supply them. 
On our side, um, there's also added advantage. We, we gain a strong partner with Norwegian Airlines and we collaborate on multiple fields to really push this forward and bring this um, into reality because there are many hurdles still down the line regarding logistics, certification, um, implementation and, and bringing this really into the, into the business case. Um, so, so I think there, there, is, uh, there, there are many aspects to it. And, and last but not least, having robust off-take agreements is, is a very important role that helps bank to overcome a perceived technology risk. Because we always need to talk about multiple risk in a project. You have the market risk, which is sort of the uncertainty of, is this fuel, will this fuel be needed? I think everyone can say, yes, it will be needed. But what price will, will people be willing to pay for it? And I think there we have seen, at least in Europe, some, some very important policies in, in the recent year, let's say, uh, popping up. The second big question is, is then, of course, um, risk perceived to the project. And, and that is both technology risk, but also it's, it's overall risk perceived by lenders. And I think this is something where these sort of partnerships can really help to overcome hurdles and burdens. Thanks. And I'll follow up on that because you mentioned policy as well. So the, in a way, the offtake agreements or the partnerships are stuff that you do basically amongst private sector stakeholders, but there's also this as the, the role of the government and the policy. And uh, in specific cases of aviation, now there are very clear sub-targets for, for synthetic SAF, very, very clear targets for SAF. Um, there is also a bit of a debate between the approach that has been taken in Europe, which is more focused on regulation and uh, raising revenues to fund innovation through carbon pricing, and the approach that has been taken in the US, which is focused more on subsidies and uh, doesn't include carbon pricing necessarily, California being an exception. Uh, but yeah, do you want, and you are basically operating now in this space. You have to take investment decisions. Uh, how is this affecting your choices? Uh, do you have a view on EU versus US approach? Well, this is, of course, a the very million loaded dollar question. question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, but I think um, may maybe let me start uh, be before uh, anyone misunderstands what I'm going to say. I think, first off, uh, the Refuel EU initiative, the Refuel EU aviation initiative specifically, I believe is, is an, a very important milestone, specifically because it includes all those sub targets in, in a five year time frame with a clear growth path, um, which is quite unique and absolutely necessary. This creates the certainty to the market. This creates volumes that you can calculate down to and say, look, this is the market gap. This needs to be filled. These are the projects. We are one of them. That is, that is part of a story that investors can buy into. And that's what you need to do. You need to mobilize private equity into, into these sectors as well. Um, so I think it's absolutely important and, and it's great that we have this uh, within the EU. Um, and most importantly, even that there are sub-targets for, for well, e-fuel or hydrogen-derived fuels, I think it's incredibly important because, as you mentioned, I believe in the beginning, um, if you would not do that and you would just impose a sort of a, just a soft target, um, it, it would be filled by biofuels at the beginning, up until a point where there's no more left. And then you're asking, well, okay, now I would like to have more, but, well, the industry has not developed. So you need to really help develop the industry out down the path. So uh, long story short, it's a great initiative. However, <laughs> um, however, you, you of course have always the issue, and that, that is the, the question. Now you have a market, but now the question is, is there a first mover advantage or a first mover disadvantage? And I think that's a typical question you always have. The first mover advantage is you can have your partnerships set up early on, you can secure good sites, you can have good feedstock supply, all of that is great. The disadvantage is that basically everyone is expecting this market to become easier. Certification will become clearer, policies will become clearer, trading will be easier, and some of the core equipments are expected to go down in cost if there's a general uptake in electrolysis, for example. So the question is, how do you convince people to move now, to, to now put their money in? And that's where you need to overcome the first mover sort of disadvantage. And I believe this is where the Inflation Reduction Act comes in by just broadening, giving out subsidies sort of to, to a whole industry, um, the, 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 the logic is a bit of a different one. You want to be early to grab those subsidies in order to build up the industry and be one of those that still gets them. Um, and, and that pushes it. And don't get me wrong, the, the, the IRA is, is not perfect. It's a blanket subsidy. There's a lot of inefficiencies in it. 
Um, it, I'm not saying it's solving everything, but it, it's, clearly, it's clearly targeting this issue. And uh, if, if you would want to be a bit polemic, you could say, well, uh, Europe is, is uh, creating the market and the US is take, making sure that they will have the industry to supply it. Right? So, so it's a bit of a, um, I think, to, to be, to be too, too critical here. Now, the point is, Europe is, of course, also targeting the, the first mover disadvantage, but in a different way. And it's, uh, for example, the ETS Innovation Fund, it's very specific vehicles that invest into cer certain projects. Um, and while I think this is great, it's, it's a very important vehicle, and I think it's great that the EU has it, um, I believe the, the problem with that is it's not fast enough. Because you always have a situation where a few projects will be funded, and let's say in, in this field, maybe two next year. Um, probably 15 have applied for it. It's a very lengthy process. Your, your whole organization needs to focus on the application for three to six months, preparing, writing. It's a lot of money that goes into it. Then you have an additional six months of waiting period, then maybe you get a yes or a no. Basically, you have held up all 15 promising projects in this process, and two of them may go forward. What happens to the other 15, right? So, so basically, you, you have indirectly created a stopping point and that slows down the process because all, in, all investors will wait for those subsidies. So, so that is a bit of, a, of the conundrum there. And I think, uh, and that's why I started with saying, I think the Refuel EU Aviation Initiative is great. Um, so, so I think it's absolutely needed. Um, but, but the interesting part, I believe, that we have to think about is how do we get some of those simplifications that are created, for example, in the US via the IRA, and simply making it easier to create a business case and to invest and to be an early mover? How do we get some of them translated into a European setting, for example, um, if, if we talk from a European perspective? Thank you very much. So I'll, I'll link to the next speaker, which is my Sarah, uh, on on this topic of the pace of the change. Uh, so in a way, Carl, you, you mentioned there, a, there are issues, there's a bit of rust, let's say, in the way Europe uses the funds uh, and uh, it could do better. One of the reasons is that we're talking about a very short transition. Nelson, also, you mentioned that. And uh, my Sarah, Irene has been doing a lot of work on uh, scenario work. Uh, regarding emission mitigation and fuel switching. Do you want to tell us more about like, how the pace of this transition, how this scenario work highlights this kind of aspect? <clears throat> Thank you, Pierre. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I will talk in terms of what Irina's work on, especially on the world energy transition outlook, where we map out the different pathways, um, both for end use sectors and also power sector. So we analyze how to mitigate these emissions and what are the technological pathways by, and to achieve net zero by 2050. We should be aware of the, listening to all these conversations since yesterday that like both aviation and the shipping sector are really hard to decarbonize sectors and we should acknowledge that and there, are, there is no clear, there are many multiple challenges both technologically, operationally and commercially and these these are very complex questions, and as we have heard both from these panels, there are many hurdles to be done. Not to mention that because it also um, deals with international boundaries, and these are not really captured within national policies, this is also increases the complexity. Um, in terms of our scenarios, we show that in terms of demand of traffic and goods for the shipping sector, it will increase around 2% every year, depending on the type of goods that will be traded globally. For aviation, we've seen a massive increase um, in growth, especially after post-COVID, and this will continue to develop, especially for Asia and Africa. Um, coupled with this, with all of these ambitions, um, with airlines, uh, shipping industry, and all these regulatories, and also national policies surrounding these sectors. So there are very interesting developments coming from different stakeholders. There's so much things to talk about, actually. Yeah. Um, so for IRENA, the pathway is very clear. So we know what we need to do, like to achieve net zero, but how do we get there? So for us, as also shown by Carlos and Pierre, your presentation today, energy efficiency is one, where we need to tackle what are the techno we need to improve technologically, both in the aviation in terms of aircrafts and also in vessels, 
Second one, also to improve it operationally, both at logistics, this includes ports, aviation, and, and bunkers, so this is in terms of efficiency. The second one is, of course, in terms of fuel switching, where there are so much different choices. I will not say the word silver bullet, but uh, there are a variety of choices that are in conversation today. For aviation, there are two, which is um, SAFs, in terms of both biofuels and also e-fuels. And for uh, the shipping sector, we're talk when we talk about long distance shipping to carry all these goods around the world, um, ammonia and methanol is very clear. Or when we talk about short distance shipping for cruises, for example, 10 kilometers or so, it's electricity, biogas, and also hydrogen. So there are multiple techniques and technology in order to decarbonize both these sectors. From our perspective in the world energy transition outlook, in terms of e-fuels, um, this would comprise around 70% of, e-fuels would comprise 70% of the share of energy demand by 2050 in order to uh, reach the 1.5 degrees Celsius. What this actually means in, in terms of demand is that actually today almost all aviation and shipping, they use fossil fuels as demand. And there's a lot of interesting conversations around hydrogen, but the truth is reality today, as of 2023, there's less than 1% of all energy demand that uses e-ammonia and methanol, although there is increased interest in that. So um, in order to scale up to e-fuels up to 70%, there will be a lot of increased demand, especially for renewable source electricity. Thus, the question of trade and supply comes into play, and as we've heard about it, how do we source these electricity? Our perspective at IRENA, there is no shortage of renewable electricity that we can source with around the world, but given the right infrastructure, market policy, and different instruments, this can be addressed. So um, I can also talk about different works uh, that IRENA has done. So we have the World Energy Transition Outlook where we address both the shipping and aviation sector, but as uh, my colleague Carlos has um, addressed, we have work in methanol and ammonia reports. We also have specialized report in aviation and shipping. And also we do also, re we are doing some projects uh, to look into different regional perspectives and how can SAFs be grown, for example, in Southeast Asia and Central America. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. And uh, maybe this is a general question before we say we transition into the slidos. Uh, so we talked about here about demand, the need for speed, uh, offtake agreements, so ways to try to mobilize in a way secures that demand. Uh, have you seen anything happening where the two sectors, which in a way need a similar kind of fuels, to, at least to some extent, uh, have been coming together to try to mobilize demand jointly? I mean, are there, is there scope for increasing the case for uh, like reducing risks uh, for like an increase in demand by bringing together stakeholders in aviation, stakeholders in shipping. Is that something that any of you has witnessed? Um, Bruno. Maybe uh, I start. I think uh, we saw recently the announcement of two players from the maritime sector getting together, Maersk uh, and CMSCGM. But CMSCGM is also a, a, an airline operator. So some way already yes, there has like some bridge with this kind of agreement. Uh, I think I, I can mention also um, uh, a recent uh, launch of uh, investment from HY24, which is this uh, hydrogen uh, investment fund, into, um, uh, into a, a P2L or uh, uh, e, uh, ESAF uh, company in France. And this company has two projects, one which is e-methanol in the northern part of France, oh, sorry, in, uh, in, in the uh, uh, Mediterranean part of France, and uh, ESAF in the southwest part of France. So the same company. Uh, having two projects, one to feed the shipping industry, one to, to feed the, uh, the aviation industry, and uh, common investors uh, co covering these kind of things. So I think we, s we start to see some elements of bridging the two sectors. I've not seen, to my knowledge, but maybe uh, Nelson can read more, 
uh, yet a joint, let's say, offtake, a combined offtake agreement uh, between big players from the Asian and shipping industry, which could help project owners to secure the uh, robust offtakes, as we said before, uh, and, and get the financing. Uh, and probably something that we can investigate more, but maybe Nelson. Yeah, yeah just that very quickly. Uh, I think we have started to see movement of the big players. Right? some of the big, big companies in the world. Having said that, and I think it's pointed out yesterday and in other forums, these are announcements. Most part of them, is on, we, we know that 4% have financial uh, investment decision really on them. The rest are MOUs, are announcements across the world, not the specific regions which are not really taking off yet. We heard this morning uh, that there are different projects, uh, even hubs, I think she mentioned it, uh, in the Middle East region, as well as in Australia, and we hear more and more about it. But the second thing that we have already is projects that are directly linked, even in the global south, for example, in Chile, or in other uh, countries for a purpose of gaining or having ammonia being delivered to them. So in Japan, in Korea, in the EU, and mechanisms started to be there to support this movement. A joint aviation, shipping, steel, or other sectors attempt to be in part of that consortia, I haven't seen that yet. Uh, but I think it's an interesting case because this de-risking uh, problem of uh, starting, as you pointed out correctly, the first mover advantage, how do you hedge a little bit towards that, it, it may become an opportunity for some of not so big players to come in and participate at this earlier stage of the market development. It has to be properly incentivized, and that is where we have the two front runners, the IRA in the US, the EU, but we also heard the China uh, uh, developments, which are uh, incredible. So it is how other economies become part of that equation and that aggregated demand. Uh, they don't choose just shipping to transport, but actually to facilitate the bunkering as well. Thank you, Nelson and, and Bruno. I, I want to bring some questions from the audience, too. And uh, it sounds like uh, aviation is very popular amongst the audience. I encourage you to also um, like questions on shipping so we can be balanced. Uh, and the questions on aviation, I mean, a couple of them, I see they deal with contrails. And so maybe we should uh, give a chance to Bruno to talk or whoever. I think you're probably best placed to elaborate a bit on, on the topic of contrails. I mean, this is important in aviation because it increases the climate forcing impact. I understand there are efforts starting to, to deal with this. And yeah, so over to you. OK, thank you. Yeah, I'm not a specialist in the contrails, but I will say as much as I can <laughs> on the topic. First, we recognize that um, uh, the um, environmental impact of, uh, of aviation is not only limited to CO2, that there are also the non-CO2 elements to be addressed, so contrails in, is part of it. Uh, what I can say is that for the uh, zero E aircraft, uh, so the one which will be powered by hydrogen, uh, we have a dedicated demonstrator to, um, uh, to study what will be the contrails uh, impact of using hydrogen. We, we believe that it will be lesser than, than with, uh, uh, than with current, uh, uh, current uh, propulsion system, but we will test that. So we have a plan, we have a demonstrator uh, with a small um, hydrogen combustion uh, engine that we put on a glider, and we'll, uh, we have a, uh, an aircraft following this glider to, to measure precisely. So we'll, we'll run all this campaign. So we do t take it very seriously, and we have our as a demonstration plan and uh, flight test uh, in, in preparation for that. Do you already know if hydrogen is worse or better than conventional fuels, or is let's so, say so? First, yeah, so in, in terms of non-CO2 uh, related emissions, uh, hydrogen is better because it, it, there are no NOxes, for instance. So already in terms of NOx, it's better. Uh, so as I said regarding contrails, uh, I, I believe that it is 
better because the flight conditions are also different. It's not flying at the same altitude. So due to a combination of different elements, we believe it is better, but we want to test it. So this is why we have, we have this flight test planned. Thanks. So then we have, we're done on the contrail question. Uh, I saw, um, yeah, um, so I think this, this is the one from Masuda. Then uh, let me try to get another one. Um, yeah, there's a question on operations, which is on aviation and uh, but it's something that is also relevant for shipping. So in a way, I showed earlier the wedges of efficiency operation fuels. Is there any link between operational aspects and the fuel itself? Uh, I mean, this is a question for people in shipping and people in aviation. Is, are there implications on fuel switching on certain type of operations? And is this a pro or a con? Yeah, maybe I, I start. <laughs> I'm, I'm launched, so I yeah. continue. Uh, yeah, so on, on, on operations, uh, clearly we are, we are looking at how to optimize the trajectory of the aircraft, for instance, optimizing the idle uh, flight and the descent flight of the aircraft. This will can play for on a couple of percentage of, uh, of fuel consumption, so which will build on, on emissions. So it's always good because you don't have to change anything in terms of technology of the aircraft, it's just the way you fly the aircraft and optimize the trajectory, not in terms of speed or in terms of time, but in terms of less consumption. Uh, and our subsidiary NavBlue has developed solutions that airline customers can, 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 uh, can use to do so. And also I will, I will have another small story on that uh, because we did a demo, demo flight uh, inspired by, by geese, by the birds, uh, by having what we call the fellow fly, so to, to have an aircraft just following another aircraft very close, so that it can benefit from the vortex ex effect of the first first aircraft. And we did this demonstrator this demonstration over Atlantic Ocean between Paris and, and Montreal with two A350 aircraft, uh, and it confirms that we could gain about 10% uh, reduction in fuel consumption. So it is huge. It requires, it has, there are some prerequisites, so it's not that easy to implement, but uh, having this kind of uh, biomimics uh, type of solutions can also help reduce, reduce the, uh, the, the fuel consumption. Thanks. So I want to bring in the rest of the crowd on the fuel side, and I see that there is a question about the potential for e-fuels in different parts of the world. I think this is more inclusive, let's say. So I'm sure there are aspects related with ammonia availability and cost also the UNFCCC and how this, what, what is being done to try to balance. Yeah, and so does anybody want to take the question on the, if you will, uh, potential in different parts of the world and what is being done? Well, I would say that for me, the, um, the most immediate demand that we see, not just in shipping, but in, in all the different sectors that we look for ammonia, is uh, more uh, first movers with some kind of voluntary commitment maybe to decarbonize uh, you know, their uh, corporate emissions or to uh, actually launch some kind of premium product that is based on, on a lower carbon footprint. And uh, I think it's those individual companies through, well, when we talk about shipping, maybe through the, the use of um, green corridors, for instance, uh, that in a way are the kind of the the first movers, you know, the, these are not so much limited to one particular region. It's, it's then often, you know, say, Singapore to um, Shanghai or, you know, these uh, individual routes that will, in a way, be de decarbonized first. I think that's, that's what we see now as the most, um, uh, with the most potential in the short term. So, are, if you will, since they, they can't, they're cheaper to produce in places with higher renewable potential, also a development opportunity, uh, in a way. <clears throat> Is that maybe for, for you, Ben? Thanks. Um, just two weeks ago, I came back from the, the Africa Climate Summit. And one of the key topics there, and, and that's not necessarily only e-fuels, but in general, how can we best participate in this energy transition um, on a broad scale? And what is happening there across the continent and what we are observing in many other regions in the world is really that countries are looking into the potentials they have um, and these potentials that can contribute. That is on one end um, renewable energy, that is um, capacities that are shipping um, 
lanes and port availabilities that are um, critical minerals that are being looked up and, and researched. And so this is currently happening because the, the magnitude of the challenge is so massive that there is a lot of opportunity in there. And many countries that in the current setup have been left out of, of these development opportunities are now going back and studying their own um, circumstances, their own resources, and their own opportunities. And I think a lot is coming in the future um, in our direction where regions and countries come forward with different propositions that are very beneficial in powering and, and driving this transition, not necessarily only for e-fuels, but in a broader sense. Um, maybe, I'll, if, I, if I may, I would, I would absolutely second that. I think uh, what you have with e-fuel production is, is a sort of a democratization of, of power production throughout the world. And while, while it's true, you of course need power and you need renewable resources, um, there, there are many more factors than just that. It's definitely the dominating factor, but it's not the only factor. And you do have good resources in quite a lot of spaces around, around the world. So I don't think it will be limited to only one or two regions will be sort of the winning regions in the future. I think it will be much wider spread. And just to give you a few examples, right? I mean, there's also a very capital intensive industry. So the idea of where to invest, what is the political framework, how can you invest, how secure is your investment will play an important role. You will have enormous needs on infrastructure, harbor infrastructure, deployment, where, where are your markets, where to ship it to. Um, depending on what fuel you're talking about, if you're talking about um, hydrocarbons for aviation or methanol, you require CO2. Where to get the CO2 from? Will it be direct air capture? If it's direct air capture, do you have the space for it? If it's not direct air capture, how do you get the CO2 there? Because most of the time where you have CO2, the prices are not the lowest. Where the prices are the lowest, CO2 is not necessarily available. So all of a sudden, you, you start combining all of these aspects, and you find that there are thousands of niche applications where it makes a lot of sense, right? There's not the one solves all region where you say simply this, this solves everything, right? And, it, and it, it has an impact also on the technology selection. Um, are you talking about more variable renewables? You're going to choose a different technology than if you have a more stable supply on renewables, which might be backed by a strong hydropower uh, grid, for example, as you, you might see in Canada or, or Norway. So, so it, it has an impact on all these. And, and I think, therefore, what, you, what you're really looking at is um, a spread of, of e-fuel projects popping up all over the world. There will be clear focus areas. It will most likely not be in the middle of Germany, but it will also not be only in the Middle East, so to speak, or only in Australia. Um, and uh, I think the, the really interesting part will be about, can you capture potential positive side effects of those developments all over the world, right? Because I think there are those potential positive side effects. But history has told us as well that when you talk about sort of resource extraction, which, which this is to some extent, there are also potential negative side effects. So I think we are in a, in a good position now to rethink this in a smart way, um, that, that this could actually become a democratization of, of sort of the industrial uh, energy um, supply of, of the world. Nelson, you have 30 seconds to close. I will put it very quickly. Okay. I'll make it, from my perspective, personal perspective, simpler uh, than what uh, our colleague here has said. It's about great prioritization. Cost, of course, matters. Renewable energy, electricity, the cheapest, the better. But where can you have the scale that we've been talking about here? If you have, if you're in a country with a grid operating already, you want more renewables in to green your grid, you have electrical vehicles demand, you want which country has the planning to have additional renewables for fuels. If you don't have that, if you don't have the space, if you're costly, that makes it tremendously difficult. It's grid prioritization. If you don't have access to the grid, nothing of the rest will come. That is the key. Countries that have an opportunity to provide permits quicker for scaling large plants, one gigawatts, those are the ones where the opportunities lie first. Thank you, Pierre Paul. So we close here on scale. <laughs>
there's a, there's a <laughs> because you're on scale, uh, I think we all agree that the, the challenge is really large. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the panel, and I hand it over back to uh, our Irina colleagues. Thank you all very much. That was a fascinating discussion. Could I ask Carlos Ruiz to come up and give some concluding remarks on behalf of Irina? First of all, uh, I'd like to thank all of our excellent speakers. I think we had a great panel today. Uh, a special thank, to, thank you for uh, Pier Paolo and the UC Davis Institute for Transportation Studies, who, is, uh, who partnered, our, partnered with us to bring uh, you this session today. Uh, I'm quite pleased with the session. Uh, I've taken notes of, of some of the key points that were discussed today, um, very importantly, including the, the role that I see we can play, uh, engaging our membership, communicating these points, informing their policies, uh, and also connecting the, the different actors uh, to achieve this effort. Um, our homework, I think, is clear. Uh, we need to make sure that these discussions inform our, our, our work and feed into our program. And <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, we're going to bring these inputs also to, to the upcoming COP where we'll have a couple of side events with IMO, ICAO, UNCTAD. Um, and we will also uh, bring them into uh, some of the ongoing projects that we have with other partners, like the European Commission, the uh, International Chamber of Shipping with the uh, SEM Hubs Initiative, uh, Global Maritime Forum, Getting to Zero Coalition, and other industry players that we are uh, in talks with and trying to inform uh, their uh, conversations and inform our own uh, work. Uh, finally, uh, just to let you know that we remain keen and available to keep discussing these topics further and, and bring them forward uh, together with you. And we'd be very happy to hear from you uh, soon and advance the, these topics together. Thank you. <laughs>